Hello everybody, uh, Dr. Rick Wallace here dropping in on you. Hope everybody's doing good, I really do, I really do. I'm leaving the office, um, about to get some things done on the way to the crib. I wanted to chop up something, talk uh, black group economic strategies and how it looks outside of the obvious by black thing that everybody talks about. It's so much more than that. There's a, literally a psychology behind it. And I'm, I'm about to use a very relevant and recent story to bring that home. Before I do that, I want to remind you that we're in the middle of a fundraiser and I want you guys to really show some love and support the work we're doing at the Black Men Lead Rite of Passage Initiative. And like I said, that's just one thing we're doing, but it's so prevalent now with the issues we're doing with mental health, with young black males and the spike in suicides. I told you guys uh, yesterday uh, in a video, and I think the day before that, just between 2013 and 2019, the increase in black male suicides between the age of 14 and 24, excuse me, 15 and 24, was 47% in that six year period. That's astronomical if you understand uh, statistics and how this thing uh, works itself out. We get the stories that draw headlines when somebody famous or the relative of somebody famous commits suicide. You hear about it. There are thousands outside of that realm that you're never going to hear the story about it unless they do it on so social media. And we've seen that happen. Um, but that's an issue. So again, we are working to build strong black men and that means whole black men. That means healthy black men. And so that's a part of the process and so many others. So show some love and support. Now, speaking of black men, Blind Flores, the uh, former head coach of the Miami Dolphins, a black man, exceptional coach, loved by the players, did a lot with nothing while in Miami. Uh, has recently filed uh, what has turned out to be a class action lawsuit with uh, against at least three teams in the NFL and the NFL as a conglomerate. Uh, and, and basically, he is claiming racial discrimination. Well, we know that racial dis discrimination is a reality, not only in the NFL, but major sports, period. But definitely in the NFL, the good old boy system is in full swing. Uh, you see a lot of black coaches uh, in the NBA. You've got one black coach right now out of 32 teams, same amount of teams in the NBA, I think. And uh, you got one black coach and he has a tenure. Uh, he's you know, one of the longest uh, tenured coaches in the NFL. And that is Mike Tomlin with the Pittsburgh Steelers. And that's because that's just how uh, that family gets down. They've had three coaches in 40 something years. They have a, a way of being loyal to their coaches. And when they brought him on, they believed in him. And he has in his 15 seasons of being their coach, never had a losing season, which has a lot to say about uh, his ability to use what he got, use what he has and the connectivity he creates and the culture he has. Uh, because you got to know that there are some times that the team wasn't that good. And this year was one of those times. Team wasn't that good, but the team still found a way to pull out a winning season and fight their way into the playoffs. Amazing what he's done. But there have been some other good coaches that haven't had a chance. Now, what I want to point out is a unique thing that happens, and you've got to be careful about this idea of inclusion. Because back in 2003, they instituted what's known as the Rooney Rule. And the Rooney rule refers to the agreement that black coaches would be uh, every team who had an opening at, uh, in a coaching position would be required to interview a non-white a, a minority uh, coach uh, of course all they had to do was interview them and appear to give them an equal opportunity in the process and it met the demands of the Rooney rule it didn't say a certain amount had to be hired so, you know, there have been some hiring of some black head coaches, but the standard at which they're judged is different. Um, now, what's interesting about the claim that Brian Flores is making is 
that he may have actually been fired because he did better than he was supposed to. See, what happens is a lot of times, if you notice, head, black head coaches get jobs when the team suck. I mean, they don't get brought in. Like, for instance, let's go back and talk about John Gruden. John Gruden has a Super Bowl ring. You know, he's he was ceremoniously dismissed this year because of some racial emails that popped out. But he has one Super Bowl ring. Uh, he's a fiery coach. Players like to play for him. But he inherited a team that a black coach, Tony Dungy, who eventually got his Super Bowl ring with the Indianapolis coach. But Tony Dungy built the Tampa Bay Buccaneers that won the Super Bowl under Gruden. He built that team and was let go, and they brought in Gruden. Gruden won the very next year with the team that Dungy had built under the pretty much the culture Dungy had created. Dungy proved that he was exceptional by going to Indianapolis and creating another winning team and winning a Super Bowl um, in, in, in Florida, uh, ironically and poetically. Uh, anyway, fast forward. Brian Flores was brought into a team that was literally gutted had no pro bowlers, was not a winning team. And from what he's uh, alleging and what some other coaches are coming out and say happens in the league is he was actually approached by a representative of the owner of the Miami Dolphins and told that he would be given $100,000 for every loss they had that year. At the time, they hadn't won a game. And he was, uh, what they wanted to do is tank the season to get better draft picks because the per team with the worst records gets to pick first. Okay. So what he ended up doing is winning five games in a season that they had actually been predicted by the experts of losing every game. He won five games. He ended up with a team again that still isn't good with a pretty much 500 record. I think 24 and 25 was his record. So he pretty much won 50%, uh, nearly 50% of his games with a subpar team, meaning that the dude is beastly, if you understand the game. And his team loves to play for him. Um, here's the thing. So basically, what you have to understand, I'm, I'm going to give you the dynamic that I'm going to talk to you about strategy. The dynamic is black coaches are bought in to lose to bring better white, bring in better draft picks, to then fire for losing, and then hire white coaches to take those draft picks and win with them. Uh, it gives the illusion that white coaches are better than blacks, but the truth of the matter is, you brought that coach in with the purpose of losing. You didn't give him anything to win with. What Flores did is win despite of, and this is why he was let go because he wouldn't tank. You know, he's got him in contention for a minute. His quarterback was hurt for a while. Uh, you know, I lost my juice for the NFL a while ago. You know, I'm not in any way emotionally connected to the fandom of what is the NFL anymore. I still have a team that, you know, I consider to be the team that I like to see win. Uh, they almost uh, made it to the Super Bowl this year, 49ers. But I don't get emotional. Try. I don't jump. I don't cheer. I don't get excited. I don't go shooting at other people about their team. I don't get all into the Dallas Cowboy hatred and all that because I'm not invested in anything that doesn't bring me something. I refuse to be emotionally invested in something that I don't benefit from one way or another. Now, maybe if I was gambling on games, I'd be emotionally invested in it, but that would be stupid. But anyway, back to it. What you have to understand is the depth of what Blind Flores has done. The moment that Brian Flores filed that lawsuit, it was career suicide. Nobody's going to hire him now because he's suing the league, meaning that all 32 teams are under the darkness of that lawsuit, even though he's naming several teams specifically. So also, who's going to hire someone that can bring legal liability to them? So what did he do? He did what we need a bunch of people to do. Go out and say, I've had enough. I'm going to stand up for it. I'm going to take one for the team. And I'm going to trust that I can do what I can for my family without this particular entity. And I'm going to call the spade a spade. I'm going to put them on blast. I'm going to make them bring things to the table. And 
from what I understand, he has enough to get past the first stage of this lawsuit, which is proving that the lawsuit has enough uh, validity to be viewed and to force the other side, the NFL, to respond to the lawsuit. So the NFL will will be become become a respondent to the claimant, which is him, and he made it a class action lawsuit where other head coaches or other black coaches can join in. Now, this is going to be interesting because the other black coaches have already started to speak up and it seems to be things that collaborate or excuse me, corroborate what he's saying about things. Uh, uh, God, Hugh Jackson, who is now down at Grambling, Grambling State University coaching, who used to be the coach for the Cleveland Browns, has come in and said, yes, they encourage you to lose when you don't have a team that has a chance to get to the playoffs. They encourage you to take games. That is a direct violation of the competitive uh, nature and culture and what's supposed to be. Uh, that is huge. That's to me almost like gambling. That's controlling narratives and that's actually fun. That's like taking a dive in boxing. It, it puts a, it gives a black eye to the sport. It takes away from the authenticity and the genuineness of the game. Okay, so that's that that's something else that you have to talk about. Uh, the credibility of the game and so many other things when they always try to talk about credibility when it comes to players. So in essence, that's something else that you have to think about. Now, with that out the way, what do you do in this sense? Number one is, you're never going to have equal footing in something that doesn't belong to you. I have a real simple economic process that I think about when I'm thinking collectively. And when I talk about collectivism, I'm talking about collectivism based along the lines of race. And in that uh, approach to collectivism and uh, group, group economics, uh, one of the principles that I hold to and will continue to hold to us until somebody can show me something that proves differently is that if you dominate the talent or you dominate the spending in any industry, you should also have <coughs> a level of ownership that's representative of the influence you have on the industry. 72% of the players in the NFL are black. The vast majority of that are at the talented positions. The, the positions that people come to see are the skilled positions, cornerback, linebacker, wide receiver, running back. And now we're starting to infiltrate quarterback at an interesting rate. Uh, your top quarterbacks now uh, are predominantly, even though you're going to have two white quarterbacks um, in the Super Bowl this year. Uh, we've had quite a run at the Super Bowl as far as black quarterbacks are concerned um, over the last 10 years, and that's to say a lot. So you're talking about the skill position, the things that people come to see. Don't get me wrong, none of it happens without the people in the trenches. I'm not devaluing them, I'm just talking about the money makers based off of how they're perceived by the public. You know, Ain't too many people buying lineman jerseys. So the revenue generators are your skill positions. They're black. Yet, there's no representation of blackness in the coaching, uh, head coaching arena. Now you got some uh, guys in coordinating positions and position uh, coaches uh, that are doing great jobs and should be uh, moving up the ranks. But head coaches, you got one black head coach. Owners, none. Uh, you got one minority owner, and I think he's uh, Indian, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but everybody else is good old boys. The average age of the owners in the NFL is like 70. Can you imagine that? Like 70, 72 is the average age. These old white guys are controlling the narrative. And before Bob McNair the, uh, died, the former owner of the Houston Texans, he said in a meeting that was recorded that you can't have the inmates running the asylum, asylum referring to uh, the players. 
and it got out and they tried to do a spin on it and a bunch of other things but the truth of the matter is it's exactly what he said and so that's uh just the way they think uh jerry jones during the time that players were kneeling uh because of racial inequality police brutality uh basically told his players if you, you if you kneel and you don't stand and put your hand on your heart you're cut from the team you know uh, basically you know again uh, master mentality uh, so what am I getting at I'm saying that anytime that you have that type of leverage that type of value you have to understand uh, the, the, the power you have you uh, People don't realize that the reason that the NBA was integrated, the reason that the Major League Major League Baseball was integrated, wasn't because of a moral uh, shift. It wasn't because of a social shift and acceptance. It was because people were beginning to realize the talent. That was a black team in the 50s that was so talented that it could beat any, any, any NBA team. And it was realized then that that was going to be a problem in the, in, in, in the area of revenue generation and competition. Didn't want a league like the Black Negro League, the, the Negro League in baseball, which was a direct uh, challenge to Major League Baseball. You can say, well, that ain't Major League, but you had some guys out there that were absolutely unbelievably gifted and everybody talks about um, Jackie Robinson and you, you people some people who don't understand politics and understand what really happened and don't understand the story thinks Jackie Robinson was the best black baseball player at the time and he wasn't he was a person that was built for what they needed to happen they needed a black player in the major league baseball that would be accepted that would open the door to start bringing in more players so this player not only had to be good but this to prove that they were good enough to play but he also had to be uh aware of the challenges that they were facing and what was going on and you know be politically acceptable i guess for the lack of a better term so Uh, what am I getting at? When you've got this much talent and you dominate in talent in a league and the league isn't treating you right because a lot of these players that are in the league now will come out and go into coaching and go into, analytic, uh, go into being analysts and commentators. And a lot of the players that you, a lot of coaches you're looking at now are former players. Okay, so in essence, <clears throat> If you don't see a future in an industry that you're creating, then you actually have to you actually have to uh, dodge in traffic, you guys. Sorry, you actually have to really consider what you're going to do to put yourself in a better situation. And I actually think that, and I don't th I don't see it happening. I don't think that there's a cohesiveness. I don't think that. There's the unity that's necessary, unfortunately. But I am telling you that what needs to happen is uh, this is an ideal time to do it, too, because the USFL just reopened. And so the USFL is kicking off their football season. So now there's competition. Here's a chance for black players to sit up and say, man, let's do our own thing. We're going to take all of our talent and we're going to start a league of our own. And you can leave the league open for white guys who are wanting to play to play if they're good enough to play they can play because then that creates competition where it can't just be white against black over there now you've got a chance to say man if you got a bunch of players regardless of race that don't want to play if they're not playing against the best because they can never be measured and ever called the best if they're not playing against the best. And so if you take the best and you move them somewhere else, you're gonna have a lot of other great players who aren't black willing to follow over, but you gotta be coordinated and willing to do that. And that's something that I don't think we're at, but that's what needs to happen. But be sure to understand that what you are witnessing right now 
is the unveiling of the lie. We're in a post-racist America. No, we're not. Uh, we're not in a post-racial America. Uh, we're in the same America that has always been. The only difference is uh, the social systems and the institutions evolve to be more politically acceptable, uh, more socially acceptable. But the reality is white wealth is protected. White opportunity is protected. White privilege is protected. What we need to learn is our best option isn't in trying to overcome and navigate around white privilege. It's in the establishment of black privilege, creating an environment and an economy in which the privilege belongs to us because it's created for us by us. And that sounds far-fetched because we've been programmed to think that way. We've been programmed to think we can never have and do what they've done. When the truth is, a great deal of what they've done was copied from us. These are just some of the things that you have to be aware of and you need to think about. And so again, I am interested to see how it goes, but I am like really talking and encouraging and trying to get black people to understand I'm not just talking about buying black I'm talking about building black I'm talking about owning black I'm talking about providing the same level of privilege to other blacks as white systems and Jewish systems and other systems provide for theirs we have not only a right to do it we have an obligation and on that note I'm out of here you guys have an unbelievable day don't forget to support the Black Man Lead Rite of Passage Initiative. I'm out.